Welcome to part three of lecture two of aerospace propulsion. So the answers to the question that we ended off the last part with are that for subsonic flow, if the Mach number is less than one, the mass flux and the velocity increase with Mach number. So the Mach number increases when the area decreases. This is our intuitive behavior, uh, understanding of flow behavior. For supersonic flow, Mach number greater than one, the mass flux and the velocity decrease with Mach, with Mach number. So the Mach number increases with increasing area. This is counterintuitive, but this is essentially how uh, traffic flows, um, right? Um, because when you've got more uh, lanes, uh, traffic tends to move more quickly uh, than when you've got fewer lanes. Um, so this is essentially uh, a lot of simplified traffic modeling actually uses uh, 1D supersonic flow uh, governing uh, assumptions. The key thing there is what is the, uh, the speed of sound essentially and in fact in traffic it's quite low and it has to do with how far ahead of you you can see. But I digress. Now in terms of the behavior of the static pressure, the static pressure always decreases with increasing Mach number no matter what the Mach number is. And the throat area sets the mass flow that we can have, assuming the flow is choked there, so that we have Mach 1 at A equals A star. So the throat mass flow uh, per unit area um, is a really useful quantity um, to use to sort of define what's going on in our nozzle. So if we define our mass flow, uh, right, our mass flow is going to be the pressure in the combustion chamber, the stagnation pressure in the combustion chamber, um, times uh, the area at the throat over C star. Um, and what is C star? Well, C, uh, C star is, uh, assuming we're dealing with an ideal gas, it's going to be this square root of R, t uh, the temperature in the combustion chamber over big gamma. And this big gamma is just this complicated thing that just has to do with, with the little gamma, the ratio of the specific heats. The good news is we don't really need to often think about computing this big gamma very accurately because it's about 0.67 for most practical values of the specific heat ratio. You can see that here. All right, so to first order, we could approximate this thing as about 0.67 all the time. Right, at, Mach, at uh, gamma 1.4, it's about you know, 0.685. Uh, so at gamma 1.2, it's about 0.65. And typically, uh, in combustion gases, we'd be dealing with gammas around 1.3 um, to 1.35. So it's in sort of this range. But, even over this whole range, right, it's a very small amount of variation. So about 0.67 is not a bad uh, number to remember for gamma. Now, downstream of the throat in a supersonic nozzle is where things get interesting, and we have to think about what's happening with the shape of the nozzle. The Mach uh, number or velocity is really determined downstream of the throat by the ratio of the stream tube area to the throat area. Up to now, we've just assumed that these two things are the same or that the nozzle is flowing full. And we're going to maintain this assumption for now, but before today's lecture is done, in part four, we will remove that assumption and see what happens. But even then, the flow is not necessarily supersonic in the entire nozzle downstream of the throat. What we should assume is that the flow, uh, the Mach number is supersonic up to some point x. Then we can get uh, the Mach number at x from the area there, uh, the ratio of the area there to the throat area, and then from that we can get the pressure, temperature, and velocity at that point. Physically what's happening there is um, if essentially the back pressure is too high, um, th the flow will basically go through a shock wave or a series of shock waves um, to slow down to, to subsonic conditions um, and so you'll get a rapid transition from supersonic to subsonic flow in the nozzle. Um, and really it's going to be the, the pressures that determine essentially that whether the nozzle is going to flow fully or not. And we'll show this a little bit later today. Um, but first, it's useful to relate the exit velocity to the pressure. So again, using conservation of energy and the isentropic relations, we can get the equation in the middle here that uh, the velocity at any point in the nozzle uh, is related to the combustion chamber pressure and temperature and the local static pressure, P. And if we apply this to the end of the nozzle where the pressure equals the exit pressure, 
um, then the exit velocity um, is given like this. So in terms of the exit pressure and the combustion chamber pressure. It's really important to note here that this exit pressure in general is not the atmospheric pressure. That's only true if the flow is subsonic. In a supersonic flow, the exit pressure can be different than the surrounding atmospheric pressure. So using these useful expressions where we've sort of written things in terms of the, the pressures and, and temperatures, we can look at our thrust equation and write it in terms of the pressure ratio. So if we assume again that we've got full flow in the nozzle, then the thrust F is of course m dot uh, ue plus uh, the exit area times the difference between uh, the exit pressure and the atmospheric pressure. And if we use our expression for exit velocity there, um, what we'll end up with is that the force, for, you know, so basically to replace UE, um, so the force is M dot times something that has to do with the combustion chamber pressure and temperature, the exit pressure, and then the second term is unchanged. So this is sort of nice because it means we don't actually have to explicitly calculate the exit velocity. All we have to know is uh, the mass flow rate, the uh, combustion chamber properties, uh, the gas properties, uh, and then the exit pressure and the atmospheric pressure and the exit area. So when we defined that uh, mass flow per unit area, we called that C star, and we can use this to eliminate mass flow from our consideration of the thrust equations. And we, so we can write the thrust non-dimensionally. Uh, so this is the thrust over the combustion chamber pressure times A star. Um, and this is a big complicated looking function of gamma uh, times something that just has to do with the uh, exit pressure and the combustion chamber pressure area ratios and, and, and the pressures in the combustion chamber exit and at atmosphere. But the pressure ratio itself, right, this PE over PC, um, is, sorry, this air, sorry, this area ratio AE over A star is related to the pressure ratio through conservation of mass. So the AE over A star here, we can write this just entirely again in terms of the gas properties and then PE and PC. So this entire expression is fundamentally uh, this non-dimensional thrust in terms of gas properties and um, PE, PC, and P0. So now if we define a thrust coefficient for rocket engines, um, basically what we had on the left hand side on the previous side is the thrust coefficient, so force over the combustion chamber temperature times the throat area. Um, so what we had on the last slide is the expression for uh, the thrust coefficient CF for ideal gases. And there's some plots in the MIT Open Courseware notes um, that give the, uh, the behavior of this, this CF uh, versus different parameters. Now I want to link this back to the idea of the effective exhaust velocity that we used in lecture one. Right, last time we had it, the thrust was the mass flow rate times some velocity C, which was our effective exit velocity. Right, remember that was the velocity that we had when the pressure in the flow was no longer changing. Using the quantities we've introduced today, C star and CF, we can see that it turns out that C is C star times CF. So the thrust is the mass flow rate times C star time and CF. And the interesting thing is how these things depend on things. If we look at CF, um, it basically comes down to the nozzle geometry and the pressure ratio at which the nozzle is operating. And if we look at C star, um, that's mainly a function of the propellant properties um, as well as the combustion chamber pressure and temperature. So in developing this form for the expression for the thrust from a rocket nozzle, We've done something incredibly useful. We've separated the effects of the propellant properties and of the nozzle geometry. So instead of these things all being muddled up together, we actually have them nicely separated. Um, and C star essentially deals with the propellant, and CF mainly deals with pressure ratio and nozzle geometry.